Sometime in early 2005, the term patio book first appeared in the public consciousness. Podcasting, the art of creating radio-type shows meant to be downloaded and consumed on MP3 players, such as the iPod, had just begun to take off. And somewhere in Arizona, one rather inventive individual got the notion in his head that audiobooks should be podcasts. He also thought they should be free. Three and a half years later, patiobooks.com is the premier site online to get quality, free MP3 audiobooks and has launched the careers of several authors in the traditional publishing world. Please join me in welcoming the inventor of the patio book himself, Evo Terra. Evo? Mark, pleasure to be here. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks. Just for the record, it was on uh, April 11th, 2005 that I coined the term patio book. Wow. I didn't, know, I didn't realize we had the exact date. That's, that's good to know. Are you kidding? I got a screenshot of the blog post. <laughs> you have it framed on your wall. You get a poster and, and everything. <laughs> well, it's an Evernote. That's at least the case. Yes. Um, so, what is a patio book for those of, of the uh, those of those bleh, those people not watching not who don't know, which is kind of unbelievable if they wouldn't know that, but some might not. So, tell us what is a patio book. Well, a patio book in today's terminology is simply a serialized audio book that is distributed via RSS, which you and I know as a podcast. And a podcast is simply a series of files distributed via RSS. We're doing the same thing with, with patiobooks.com, but we've taken audiobooks, converted them into a serialized form, uh, kind of reminiscent to the old style of uh, radio dramas, if you will, of the uh, 20s and 30s, uh, but giving them a new twist with the novel inside of it, and we chunk them up and deliver them out over time. So we don't call them podcasted audiobooks anymore, at least I don't. Uh, I just like to call them serialized audiobooks because we really just use the technology of podcasting but that's the, that is where the name came from a com combination of podcasting and audiobook now are they are they really different from an audiobook or are they in your mind are they the same thing but podcast or is there a difference in the content I see a difference in contests or in content for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one is these are serialized. They're designed to be listened to one episode and then you go away for a while and you come back and listen to the next episode, much like you watch serialized television, different than you would watch, say, a movie. Right. Um, or a miniseries, uh, different than you would watch a movie, where an audiobook is really designed to be consumed kind of in one sitting, or as, as much of you can in one sitting as possible. So that's one difference. Ours are designed to be every 20 or 30 minutes, there's going to be a very obvious break, and uh, you go on with your, your rest of your day, and then you get the next one tomorrow or next week. That's kind of the, the, the primary idea. The second thing that's different inside of the content is we break a lot of the rules of traditional audiobooks. Uh, traditionally, in the audiobook, world, uh, sound effects, uh, having cannons explode, even having bed music is really a no-no. We don't adhere to that standard. We're okay with letting the producers take some poetic license with that, if you will. Some of them just sprinkle them in here and there. Some just put audio music or audio bed tracks underneath their intros and their outros for each episode. Uh, some are a little more enterprising and have decided to score their entire audiobook. So we give them a little bit more freedom than you're going to see in a lot of audiobooks. Yep. So how do I get uh, a patio book? How does one go about getting uh, obtaining them? Well, you go to patiobooks.com first off. Uh, we're, we're not the only place you can get serialized audiobooks, but we're definitely the largest. And every time we find an author out there who's doing it on their own, we reach out to them and say, hey, would you mind if we put your books up as well? Because uh, we're a free service and everybody can, we're the place to go to. So you go to patiobooks.com and you, uh, you, you search around. You find something you're interested in, you look at the charts, you kind of browse through whatever you'd like to do, you grab it and you uh, you simply subscribe. It's still a strange term when we're talking about audiobooks, but this is a remnant of podcasting. And so you subscribe and we generate for you a an RSS feed that contains these various episodes, starting with chapter one. You take that feed and you plug it into a tool like iTunes, I think. Almost every computer in the world now seems to have iTunes installed with it. And iTunes will periodically check that RSS feed for new episodes. And every time a new episode is available, it downloads it, it puts it on your iTunes. And if you're walking around with an iPod, like many of us are, it'll automatically transfer that to your iPod. And you're listening one episode at a time until that book is completed. What if I just want to grab all the episodes and you know have, have them all in my MP3 player? Can I do that? 
You sure can, if you know how to do it. In all honesty, that's been problematic. Traditionally, audiobooks, you go and you click and you download the entire audiobook. Well, with us, we've broken them up into serial, and it's, it's a little difficult. But you certainly can. Once you've subscribed to a feed, uh, inside of your My Subscriptions tab, we have a link that says Release All Episodes Now. And that will push out every single episode available of that book into your RSS feed. You then have to go into iTunes or your other podcatching software and tell it to get all items because by default its behavior is simply to download the most recent file right. beat that and then you got them all and you can put them all in and listen uh, however you wish to do it knock yourself out now you also have a channel on iTunes so I don't, I don't actually have to go to the patiobooks.com website I can just go into my iTunes and yeah. you know type in patiobooks and and find all the same books. Is that correct? That is correct. That's a relatively recent development. Big props to, uh, to to Scott and Pete over at iTunes for letting us do that. Yeah, we basically have a mirror of our site over on uh, on iTunes. So if you're an iTunes user, just go to the iTunes Music Store and type in patiobooks.com. You'll see a link to us come up as one of your results. You'll click that and you'll be taken to our page inside of iTunes. It has all of the same books we have at patiobooks.com with one big difference. With iTunes, there is none of this custom subscribing idea. So you get a single feed for a book, which means if you're, uh, if the author you want to listen to is on episode 13 of a book that's probably going to take them 30 chapters or 30 episodes to finish, the most recent episode for you is 13. So you have to back up and get 12, 11, 10, all the way down to 1 and start your story there and listen forward. That's the benefit of patiobooks.com is that customizes RSS feed, so we start every subscription from you from square one. But you have to go to patiobooks.com to get that. It's totally free, and you can drop it into iTunes. So either or, if you're a big iTunes user and you want all the files right now, just go to iTunes. They're all there. Now, how has that affected your numbers? Has, has, has having that new page up, that this new development with iTunes, has this uh, increased your footprint significantly? or it's, it... how, about, how about doubled? Yeah, okay, so it's had a big effect. Yeah. <laughs> big effect, yeah. Uh, you know, just a few short months ago, uh, we were pushing out some of the neighborhood of 30 and, uh, and 35,000 episodes. That quickly grew to 50 and then to 60. And yesterday, we had our best day ever. We pushed out a little over 81,000 episodes. And it wow. was at about the exact same time we got that new iTunes page. So that's uh, definitely a direct correlation if I ever saw one. Wow, I guess so. So, um what makes a what, what makes a good patio book in your opinion? What I mean, what what are the people that succeed and 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 tend to get loved? What what is it that they do that's different? A couple of different things. One is the content. Obviously, there are some books that I think lend themselves to um, um, not only a better audio experience but also a better serialized experience. Um, and, and those are. If you're a big cliffhanger type person, if that's your writing as a cliffhanger style at the end of every episode, man, people just kind of eat that stuff up. That really compels you to keep listening and wanting more of that. So I think the story has something to do with it. I also think it's production quality has a significant amount to do with it. Some people are able to get by with a really inexpensive rig, uh, like you know twenty dollars worth, and record a decent sounding book. Most of the people that have success uh, found success on PatioBooks.com have invested a little bit more of that, not. Ten Tens of dollars, but hundreds of dollars, and it's usually a low hundreds of dollars number to get a better sounding uh, audio rig. They also tend to take a little bit more time and care, and not just rush it out. They do spend a lot of time editing. Editing is the longest process of this whole process, um, outside of writing the book, obviously. But <laughs> spending a lot more time editing the the audio files as you do them makes a lot of sense. And the third factor um, is truly what I call the Trent Reznor effect, right? And this is someone, an author who has figured out how to relentlessly connect with their fans. It's not the Ron Popeil set it and forget it mentality. You have got to be there interacting with your people, answering their questions, answering their comments they leave to you on the, on our website, answering what they're saying about you in their Twitter feed, going to various Facebook pages, all of this social media realm crapped up at about the same time that this new media realm happened of things like podcasting and authors who have really embraced that and said I'm going to be there for my audience have a much greater chance of reaching success. Now which of these outlets do you think is the most important? I mean, we mentioned Twitter, we mentioned Facebook, um, Goodreads, does that factor in at all? What do you think is the most important? 
You know, to me, it, you're asking a question about strategy and social media, which is what I do as my, my consultancy gig, and there is no single tool that's right for everyone. Tools are usually the last thing you look at when you're figuring out your social media strategy, and you always start with the people. Where are the people that you are trying to reach, and what activities are they doing online and specifically where are they hanging out uh, in, in the social media realm. So if you're going to follow in the footsteps of authors who've come before you, if you're not a science fiction book, well the Twitter and Facebook are going to be very popular places for you to be because that's where the trail has already been blazed. But if you're a nonfiction author, then places like LinkedIn may be a much more adequate place for you to gather uh, support, especially if it's a book about business and some other more business specific places to go into. You mentioned Goodreads. I think Goodreads and Shelfari and other places like that that are really book sharing services can do fantastic jobs as well if in fact that's where your audience hangs out. Uh, it's difficult to put a finger on where's the one place to be. Well I noticed that actually on Goodreads that some of the um, Goodreads has basically you can have book entries on Goodreads but I've noticed that actually there are now uh, specifically patio book Audio book versions of books are now legitimate shelf items. Uh, yeah, Goodreads. that's one of the really nice things about Goodreads that I think takes it a step above, at least for me and for people like you. Uh, well, not necessarily for you, because you're good, but some of the authors we have don't have ISBN numbers. And, and in fact, your patio book versions don't have ISBN numbers. So a lot of sites, like Shelfari, for example, require ISBN. You can't enter anything onto that website if it does not have an ISBN number. That's fine in the printed and the published book world. Even Lulu will give you an ISBN number for relatively cheap. But patio books are designed to be given away for free. No one wants to go to the expense of getting an ISBN number to, to track sales. We're not selling anything. Right. But that's the nice thing about Goodreads. Any, they will let you put that kind of stuff up there too. So I really applaud the folks at Goodreads for allowing a little more community involvement from the more DIY community. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, so I just actually something just occurred to me. I thought that Audible.com had a uh, exclusive with Apple and, and iTunes for being the exclusive providers of uh, audiobooks online. How did you get around that with with uh, the recent development with audio books? Yeah, Audible does have a chokehold on the iTunes Music Store's audiobook selection. And so if you're an, an iTunes user and you're used to buying audiobooks from them, you're only getting things from Audible and you won't see any of our titles inside of the audiobook section. All of our stuff is inside of the podcasting section because it's delivered via that RSS feed. So I have a very good relationship with the iTunes podcasting team. I'm relatively certain that the iTunes audiobook team isn't really a big fan of ours. But that's how we get around it is because we're not in the audiobook section. Which isn't, that used to be kind of strange, but you have to remember now, Mark, we're in a, we're in a world now where many of the authors have put their books out as uh, iPod applications, apps, and yeah. those are in the iTunes store as well. So where a book belongs in the iTunes store, iTunes is really helping to blur those lines, which, which I think is great. Yeah, has, I mean, I know that there have been a lot of folks who have put their books as ebooks into the iPhone app store. Yeah. Um, is there anyone that you're aware of that's put their book as a uh, MP3 book as an app, if you will? In other words, an audio book, but as an app in the iTunes App Store. Yeah, I, I have not heard of that. Um, I, I suppose it's possible. I mean, any, anything is possible. We've tossed around the idea of, of developing something like that that is an app that lives on your phone that goes and retrieves your subscription files for a, a, a book. In, instead of going to the podcast folder, you just go into your apps folder. Right. I, I'm, I'm kind of struggling with would I ever use something like that, but I learned a long time ago in this world that I am definitely not the use case you want to be focusing on. I'm more of an edge case. But we've tossed the idea around. I, I don't know if anyone has done it yet. I think it's an. I think it is an interesting idea, actually. Because you know, now, so have you thought about you know how patio books? Well, actually, let's talk about the patio books business model first of all, because I think sure. most people may not be aware of, of what it is or is not. So the books are free, but you can give money to the authors. Yeah, right now it's funny you say business model. You know, let's see, let's let's get a lot of things <laughs> Such as it on is. and give it away for free. And, and you know, it's the underpants gnome thing, right? And the middle we don't know what it is, but the third one is profit. So yes, right now everything's available for free. We don't charge authors uh, anything to list their books on our site, um, but we do solicit don't or at least collect. Or I shouldn't say solicit. We do collect donations for people who who care to donate, and we track that by individual books, and we pass along. Today, 75% of all donations go directly to the author. We even pass along 
among the donations before the PayPal fees are taken out of it. Wow. Which is something I was I, I really wanted to do from the, from the beginning of this. I've, I've been involved in, in publishing, and specifically with a class of authors that I like to call underpublished authors, since around 2002. And I know there are a lot of people out there that are really trying to, to, to make their money off of independent authors, and I didn't want to be a guy that did that. If anything, I'd make some money along with the author, but wasn't really interested in charging authors a lot of money up front. So I decided early on that we weren't going to charge anything, and we were going to pass on at least half of the money back to the author, and then I, I quickly decided to re raise that up to 75%. So that's our existing revenue stream, which uh, effectively doesn't give us any revenue because while you know we have to pay for hosting, uh, there are some real costs that come out of this, and I'm, I'm fortunate enough to get all those bills paid for out of both the donations and the little small ads you see that pop up on the site here and there. No one's making a, a living off of this yet, but, but that's where we live today. So that's the current business model. The business model of tomorrow is a little bit different. We're going to modify audiobooks.com into think of it as more uh, of, a, of, a, of a hub for these various books. So, for example, if the we're always going to have a free serialized audiobook available, but if the author chooses to, they can go back and reformat their audio files, give them to us, and we'll create a complete traditional audiobook out of those files. So none of the serializing, no intros, no outros, no RSS feed, just a single click to download all of the files and then you can put them on your computer and do what you will, listen like a regular audiobook will be. We're going to do that, but we're going to charge for that. Uh, and we'll split the proceeds of that with the author. Again, the serialized version for every book is and always will be free. Some of them may have this option to do a pay download to get the traditional audiobook out of that. We're also going to do some additional integration with the physical copies of the book, whether that be hardcover, paperback, CD-ROM, right? Some people want a physical manifestation of the book. We're going to facilitate that as well. We, and then also, we, you talked briefly about eBooks. Well, yeah. there's only 27 different eBook formats out there. We're working on a partnership with Smashwords right now so that we can upload a single file and they can then break it out and make all the various audiobook formats available. And those will be available, some of those for free, some of those for a fee. So with luck, that gives additional revenues not only to us, but also to the authors as well. My ultimate goal is to change the system so that every penny of every single donation goes straight to the author and we just make our money off of the commission and the fees of selling the physical products. So you're actually becoming a audiobook publisher. Really? I, I guess, yeah. I've, I've really struggled to not be that for a long time, but I'm, I'm realizing that you know it kind of needs to be done because the publishing industry is a little, well, I call it broken, um, which is probably a, a little too much, but nonetheless, I'm going to stick with that. And, and I think there's some things that we can do different. I think there's some things that we can do better. So yeah, I guess uh, in a few months or a weeks or however long it's going to take them to program it, we're going to be a, a publisher. Wow, that's exciting news. I, actually, that is news to me. I didn't even know that myself. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's actually very exciting. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. So uh, let's, tell me about the state of the patio book right now. And by that, I mean, you know, how many authors do you have? How many listeners? Um, that, just give me the, the, the rough stats on where you guys are at sure, right now. Sure, happy, happy to throw some numbers out there. So we're right now sitting at 335 different books on the site. Um, we have a little over 60,000 members. Members is one of those really weird words I don't like to talk about a whole lot because... You know, a, a member means they sign up for a membership. They may have done that five years ago and not been back, so who knows. Well, what but nonetheless... You, what do you consider a member? Is it, some, is it people who are active? Is it people, anyone who has an account? Well, you see, the problem is you don't have to have an account with us. Because of that relationship we have with iTunes, right. where we put a default feed in there, there's no need to sign up for membership unless you want the custom feed. So, that's the real challenge. Our, our memberships goes up, but not everybody has to become a member to listen. So, just like anything, it's tough to put a number on how many people are, are really doing anything. So, we just stick with a number of 60,000 members, and that means they signed up for an account on our site. The other number that we like to toss out, is the one I mentioned a moment ago, uh, about the number of downloads we're getting every single day. Yesterday was our record-breaking day of a little over 81,000 episodes 
a day. Now, that doesn't mean people, individual books, that doesn't mean individual people downloading, although I, get, I think it does mean individual people downloading, but one person might have downloaded 15 different episodes inside of that. So it's tough to figure out how many people were, were out of that number. But that's a really, really big number because, you know, 81,000 episodes and our average file size for the data geek out there is somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 megabytes in size. So do the math real quick yeah. and figure out the bandwidth. You know, that's a huge pipe. So a you know, huge amount of thanks go out to the boys at Liberated Syndication, Libsyn, for their graciously partnering with uh, us to become the, the media host of choice for us to keep that bandwidth cost down because, uh, wow, that would be really expensive. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Now, I'm a big <laughs> fan of Libsyn, too, for, for people who don't know. Uh, it's called, it stands for Liberated Syndication. Uh, the site is libsyn.com. And uh, I'm not sure what their deal is these days, but basically a couple of years ago the deal was uh, they didn't care how much your bandwidth was consumed. It was the size of your file, I think it was, that they, they based it's, it on. It's the size of the new files you generate every single month. So the last numbers I saw was if you uh, would like a, a 50 megabytes a month, which is about a 10-minute show, a uh, 10 to 15-minute show every single week will get you to about 50 megabytes. Um, and that'll cost you five dollars a month, and there are no bandwidth charges. It's unmetered bandwidth, so really all you're doing is paying for the amount of traffic that you, the amount of stuff you upload and generate new. Yeah, it's each storage. Month. You're you're, yeah. you're charged for storage, really. That's well, it. and and it's and it's not even storage in the fact that you know that number resets itself every single month. So it's 50 megabytes of new content every month. So if you do the twelve dollar a month package, it's 250 megabytes a month. Oh, well, that'll take care of any podcaster. I don't care how how many shows you're putting out. You can probably be covered in that one. Uh, that is just incredible. Right, um, okay, so let's go back in time to when you first had the idea for Patio Books. What, how did you, what, what gave you the idea? Why did you do this? Um, take me through the process that led you to, to, to start this. So it was October uh, 2004, specifically, here, here's me and dates again, October 14th, 2004, uh, I was involved with a radio show at the time that had done a stint worth of syndication, uh, both uh, on terrestrial stations as well as on satellite radio. And it was on October 14th that we took that show and we converted it into a podcast. It really wasn't all that complicated because we were distributing MP3 files to our syndicate stations as well, and we already had a blog, so we had an RSS feed. So making it into a podcast took me about 30 minutes once I really got serious about it and put it together, which means back in October 14, 2004, that the, the show, which is called The Dragon Page, uh, was the 40th podcast on the interwebs, which is kind of cool. So that was a show when I was dealing with these, as I said before, underpublished authors. Discover podcasting, and I realized there was something here for authors and I just wasn't sure exactly what it was. So I started picking up the phone and talking to every author that I could. Uh, every author I had contact with and said, there's this new thing called podcasting. You've got to get involved with it. And their question was always, well, how? And my answer was, I don't know. I just know you need to get involved with it. It's really going to work for an author here. It wasn't much later that I got a phone call back from, uh, from T. Morris, a friend of mine. Uh, and, and he said, I got this interesting idea. My second book is coming out. Uh, in June or July of 2005, what if I took my first book, which has already had its print run, and what if I recorded one episode a day, or a month, or a week, whatever the time, I guess it was a week, and um, put it out as a podcast? What do you think? Can you help me with that? I said, oh, sounds like a novel idea, no pun intended. Let's give it a shot. So he did that. It seemed to work out really well. It wasn't much longer after that that I got contacted by a guy named Scott Sigler. And Scott Sigler says, hey, I've got this great idea, and I'm going to be the first one to do it. And I said, well, how about if you're not the first one to do it, but you're <laughs> among the first ones to do it? What do you say? So I helped him start putting out his book. And then I talked to a guy named Mark Jeffrey, and we started putting out his book as a, and I found a guy in New York City putting out his book and another guy in Scotland but so that I had five books within like a two week period that were all doing this and so that's when I realized okay something is happening here I need to do more with this and I need to have a place to, to wrangle these things together and more importantly some of these books if I if I don't catch them when they very when they first start I have to back up, and I don't like to back up in a podcast feed. I want to start it when it's number one, or I want to start it on show 47 and keep on going. But a book doesn't work that way. I can't start a book from episode 47. i got to start from the beginning. So that's when I had the brilliant idea. 
of coming up with this customized RSS feed that would reset for everybody that came in to get it. I announced it on the show, at the Dragon page I was talking about before. I announced what I was looking for, and a guy named Chris Miller sent me an email, and he says, I think I can whip that up for you. And in a weekend, he put together the basic engine that still powers PatioBooks.com today. And uh, the rest, I guess, in September uh, 1st of 2005, we, we made the site, which pretty much looked today as it looked then, uh, live and, and happening. And here we are uh, almost five years later, four years later. Yeah, four years now. So now, and, and in that time, actually, several authors have graduated, if you will. So you know, now you have Scott Sigler. Who is uh, a New York Times best-selling author, and uh, you know is, has a huge career now. And J.C. Hutchins is not far behind him, and yeah. uh, not to mention some of the other folks. A lot of people have gotten book deals. And yeah, so, well, when someone goes and gets, my question is, when somebody goes and gets one of these deals, do they then come back to you and uh, say, hey, you know, I got to take my book down because the publisher's, you know, a little bit tweaked. That stuff, you know, it's basically an audiobook version is up for free. How do, has there been any of that blowback from the regular publishers? Fortunately, there's been a very, very little amount of, of that sort of blowback from publishers. By and large, uh, 90 more percent of the time when, uh, when a book is optioned, when a book is licensed, when a book is whatever else we want to call it, uh, the author has been successful in convincing the, uh, the publisher to, to keep the book going on patiobooks.com and to keep it available for free for the very simple and logical reason of that's why they got the publishing deal in the first place. So why take that option away? We're also fortunate that people like Corey Doctorow and John Scalzi have kind of led the, the way before and, and showed that you can give away content for free and turn around and sell a different version of that content and make money at it and it, it'll actually work. We're kind of the first ones doing it really with audio, but nonetheless it still exists. So fortunately, no, we have not had, by and large, publishers get uh, really upset or angry or whatever. There's been a few conversations we've had to help with and, and kind of convince them of that. But in almost every case, we've been able to keep the book up live as well, even though they're out uh, selling a different version in print or in some cases, like in Scott Sigler's case, they're actually selling an audio version uh, right alongside of us giving away this free serialized version. Seems to work. So let's just, uh, let's just make sure we're really clear about this. So Scott Sigler has a New York Times best-selling novel that uh, is sold in hardcover uh, at the bookstore and is obviously selling very, very well, while you are offering that exact same novel for free as an audiobook that you, that you download, essentially, as an MP3 Marvel. audiobook. I'll give you one better. His latest book is called Contagious. Uh, it's the second in a three-book deal he got with Random House. The audiobook, the, the patio book version that we have on our site was created from the Random House produced audiobook CD, which you can buy for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 bucks, whatever an audiobook calls these days. The exact same content was used to build the serialized files we have on patiobooks.com. That's incredible. I'm, I'm, I'm actually amazed that they're letting you do that. I would have thought that maybe old stuff, but not new stuff. That would have yeah, been my it, guess. It, it, it is kind of mind-boggling. Even to a guy like me who's been doing it has seen this happen on more than one occasion, it is still a bit mind-boggling. But I think it all comes down to it's less about the content and more about the container. Really, you, the content... It's been said before, and I'll be cliche and say it again. Content was meant to be freed. I usually put a D on the end of that word. And the, the content is going to be passed around. So that's, that's just simply going to happen. But it's really more of the container that people are paying for. You buy a book in hardcover because you like the hardcover feel. You'd have to like that hardcover feel because if you just wait a few months, sometimes weeks, it'll be available on paperback for a third the price. So it's not, and the content is identical, right? But it's all about the container. I think the same thing happens in the audio world. We're giving away the serialized version, which means there's something up front and there's something at the end. It's not very long, but it's not super conducive to listening to lots of episodes in a row. That audiobook CD that you can pay for is conducive to listening to lots of episodes in a row. And it's a portable container. You can take it around with you and put it on various devices. It's not an MP3, which has its own internal quirks. So it really becomes down to the form factor. Which one are you willing to pay for? We think we can give away the serialized version to raise the awareness 
to interest people in this, uh, and, and they will then turn around and tell other folks about it who aren't interested in, buy, in listening to the free version, but who are going to be the ones that are actually buying it. And the strangest thing is, though, there are thousands of people that have listened to the book for free and then turn around and buy a copy. And then turn around and buy multiple copies. It's bizarre. You just had it, but now you want to buy it again? There's no, uh, you know, I, I can't figure people out. I'm just glad they're doing it. <laughs> it's, a, I mean, your television, really, is what this boils down to. So you might see The Wizard of Oz on TV for free, yeah. right, on MGM. Um, or you might go and buy the DVD. Or you might go buy the book. That's exactly that, right. Is that, would, that, would you say that would be a fair analogy? I think it's a very fair analogy. You know, there there are lots of ways to get the content that you want. Uh, and, and let's, I mean, let's have an open conversation about piracy for just a moment here, and and illegal file sharing, which I like to use that better than I like to use the word piracy. Again, the content's there. They're going to get it, and it's not really be, the the. the Giving this stuff away for free isn't, we have never seen, and in fact, I have several studies outside of audiobooks.com that shows giving away one version for free always, not almost always, but always causes a boost in the sale of the non free versions. We've seen that time and time again. The big concern was going to be, oh, but they'll just steal it, they'll pass it around, or they'll do it. Hey, no, none of that stuff actually works. Getting free stuff out in the marketplace boosts the sales of your premium stuff. It's happened time and time again. Ride that wave that hopefully never stops. Right. So um, if somebody is an author now, right, and they, they're a new author, someone you haven't heard of before, and they want to get their book up on patiobooks.com, do you take everybody? Is there a process? How does that work? A very, very short process. I like to say we will take anybody on the site uh, as long as they will meet our technical specifications. And our technical specifications have nothing to do with the content of the book. Technical specifications have everything to do with making sure you're formatting your MP3 files that we need in a proper way, that you're encoding them right, that you're tagging them to our specifications, and also that you're naming them to our specifications. We do that because while there is no one right way to make an MP3 file, there are a lot of wrong ways. And so our way is at least the rightest way I can come up with. So as long as you can follow those guidelines, and, and let's face it, anybody can. It's just about tagging and encoding and naming. So just do it my way and you'll be fine. And we'll take the book. We, we do not edit for content. I will give suggestions. When people make a submission to me, I will go ahead and listen to the file. And I'll make uh, audio editing suggestions. Like uh, the biggest problem is people aren't maximizing their volume uh, of of the file, which would, can you imagine that if that was on the radio, if every song on the radio was at a different volume, you'd go nuts. You right. couldn't you know, move your, but that's a problem we have inside of the podcasting world. So I try and encourage people to get their volume maximized. I try and say, uh, your intro is like five and a half minutes long. Gee, that's a lot. Uh, maybe you should shorten that up so I can get to the content better. Put some more stuff in your outro. You know, I, I give creative suggestions like that, but it's completely up to the author whether they take my suggestions to do that or not. At the end of the day, as long as they meet their tech specs, their book goes up on patiobooks.com. Cool. So if you are TV, essentially, you're the sampling mechanism, uh, television supports itself via ads. Have you guys, and it seems to me that since you're serialized audiobooks and people download you know, the, the files one at a time, you would be able to easily have timely, maybe even geographically targeted ads in the audio files, either at the beginning or the end or in the middle. And I, I, I know you guys have thought about this or played around with it, but what has been your thinking on this over the years? Well, so the short answer is we can do it all. The, the nice thing, again, about the liberated syndication to a Libsyn that we have is they will allow for dynamic inserts into the audio files. And we can do it on a geographical basis. So I, I have a history in the ad space, in the online ad space. To me, I look at something that's getting 80,000 downloads every single day. And we're not getting it every single day. Those are yesterday traffic, but give me two weeks, and I think we'll be there every single day, the way the traffic's growing these days. But yeah, 80,000 episodes are downloaded by people all over the world, most of them here in the United States, obviously. We do have a tool which will allow us to insert ads across the entire network, inside of individual books, or even into individual episodes inside of books, and then we can break that down further by geography. You want to run an ad campaign just in Detroit? Great. Although, why Detroit? No one lives there anymore. Um, but, I mean, that's the idea. We can, we can break this down geographically and do it. We, and, in fact, not only can we do it, we have done it. We've done a few campaigns, probably a grand total of five in the last four years that we have done. There's, there's two challenges to actually making this a viable and a, and a going concern and why we can truly sell advertising. Two challenges. Number one is staff. 
we, we do not have at PodioBooks.com anybody on staff who is actively out there trying to sell advertising for us. I, I think it's a possible uh, somebody could do it if somebody was you know understood the concept and could go out there and create that. So that'd be great. But the second problem is our stuff is really unlike anybody else's stuff. TV's got a long history, and I'm sure it took them a while before advertisers come on board. Well, actually, TV was created by the advertisers, but forget that for a moment. Um, so we don't have a model we can go up against and say, we're just like this. Podcasting has now, I guess, more a more rich history of selling ads inside of them. But podcasting content changes every single week, and it can move around, and there's highly focused. We're doing books, and the most of them we're doing are fiction books. How many books have you seen that have an ad associated with the book? And it's not all that common. So those two problems kind of combine together to really limit us in selling advertising. I would love to have ads running inside of every book. Now, I know a lot of people are going to freak out and hate that idea. But they're short ads. They're unobtrusive. And advertising is what makes free things like us work. Uh, right now, it's the generosity of Libsyn that's making us work. And if that were to change, I've got a bandwidth bill that's in uh, above $10,000 a month I wouldn't be able to pay. Right. So. Advertising, please. I, I, I think we really could do a whole lot more with that, especially when we have these uh, no ads inside of the downloadable audiobook version available. Now it's even more attractive, right? Like, let's put ads in that one. If you're tired of the ads, great. Jump over here, get the uh, downloadable, and you can skip them all. You just, you know, pay us a few bucks, and you're good to go. How many have you, have you, um, do you, have you put a rate card together? I mean, is there, have you, how hard have you tried to sell these ads? Haven't tried very hard at all, uh, other than working with the, the Liberated Syndication Advertising Department. Um, we've tried various uh, price points, and they've tried various price points. It seems to be the, the, the one that we have gotten more than one time is a, is a 1250 CPM. And for those of you that are not in the advertising world, that means cost per thousand is what the downloads would be. So $12.50 to, uh, to get downloads. So you know, I've got a little a package that I've put together. I haven't published anywhere because no one's really requested. This or not, you know, we can do things for you know 500 bucks a week. In fact, I can do 500 bucks a month uh, on various things and run lots of those together. You know, we've got enough to do thousands of dollars a month. But you know, a lot of companies want to test the waters out for this. So that's about as close to putting together a real rate card as we have, and and me pushing the envelope. I'm I'm not a very good salesperson, so that's my uh, my limitation. Well, okay, <laughs> so. Um we're almost out of time here, but I, I do have one other question sure. unrelated to patio books. What out there in terms of book technology um, do you find exciting right now? I mean, there's the Kindle, um, books on the iPhone, Scribd. Um, what is it that you like? Is there anything out there that's really sort of making you, your eyes light up? Well, I, I like the idea of the Kindle. I like the idea of the, what do they call it, the plastic paper? Is that what the other one is called? Plastic logic, that's the other one is called. I like those uh, as, as ideas and concepts, but I'm, I'm afraid they're not going to take off because they're, they're dedicated single devices. Um, I'm the recent owner of the, uh, of the Palm Pre, the, uh, the iPhone killer, uh, if you will. Um, but it's not going to kill the iPhone. The iPhone's going to do it just fine. The Palm Pre is a new one. I'm liking this as a device. There is an ebook reader on it, but it's not uh, the, the best in the world because it doesn't have a whole lot of titles inside of it. So I, I can see more of those. I haven't really seen any technology that's really lifting my skirt up right now because they do tend to be a little bit limiting or it's a cell phone and cell phones are simply too small. What we need is something like the Kindle that I can do more with. We need a, you know, a much smaller computer that I can do lots of various things with and just, you know, stick in my back pocket. But I haven't seen it yet. So, I mean, you, have you heard of the Crunchpad? Not heard of the Crunchpad. Oh, uh, the Crunchpad, yeah, you should uh, check it out. It's basically uh, TechCrunch Michael Arrington. Uh, has been working on essentially it's a device that looks like a Kindle but it's mm -hmm. color and it's a full computer and you know it's it's got a full operating system and it does other it's got a touch screen um, it's not out yet it's been rumored and there's prototypes and there's a lot of excitement around it but it's not yeah. it's not real yet um, but the promise is is that this could potentially be something you know the the big complaint against the Kindle is the DRM is that yeah. they essentially do not sell you a book they sell you a limited license to view the book until they get irritated, and like with 1984, they or they don't produce the license, and they can pull right. it right out of your Kindle. So it's exactly. kind of odd. People can and sneak in your house and take your books away from you, which and um, they really screwed up on that one. I mean, it, I know did. what they had to do, what they had to do, but they should have refunded everybody their money. Well, I, mean, I think they did refund everyone their money, but oh, did they finally do that? I, I'm okay, pretty sure, sure that they did. I, I don't. I, I actually, I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure that they did. Regardless, it's creepy when your books vanish. 
Big it's time. like, wait, that's mine. And, you know, and if I'd bought that as a regular book, you just can't come into my house and take it back from me. So, you know, The other thing that I think would be neat in, in the technology sphere is, look, I want to buy a book. So let's say, let's go back to talking about Scott Sigler and Contagious. I would like to be able to buy that book, and I'd like to get every single version of that one included so that I, if I'm driving in my car, I can listen. But if I get home at night, I want to be able to read it. And, and if I'm dry, and if I'm uh, standing in line at the store, and I didn't bring my book with me, but I've got my phone. I'd like to be able to read it on there. It'd be really cool if it was smart enough to know how I did that. Now I'm talking weird, crazy Star Trek technology to put this thing together. But I mean, we're living in the future. Somebody could will be able to solve this issue and, and really make this a totally ubiquitous experience for me and the environment that I'm in right now. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that's actually a great idea. Um, I, I hope someone does that. So me too. Um, well, we're out of time. Um, Evo Terra, inventor of the patio book, thank you for being on the show. Uh, Thanks, Mark. I'd like, like to also thank uh, Mood Organ for the opening music, moodorgan.com, and Jason Kalkanis, who, of course, makes this show possible. This is Bibliotech. We'll see you next time.